Hello, and welcome to this session on the people dimension of smart manufacturing. My name is Declan Watson, and I'm a partner in our human capital practice, specializing in the energy resources and industrial products industry. In this session, we will explore the people dimension of smart manufacturing. Driven by IT and ops transformation convergence, accelerating automation, democratization of data, AI and ML analytics, companies must reimagine the work being performed, how the workforce will be aligned to that work, and even where the work takes place to fully realize the potential value of smart operations. Quite often, traditional business strategies tend to overlook one critical asset, and that is people. In designing the future of work, we orchestrate across three deeply integrated dimensions to drive human-centered strategy and transformation. And those three dimensions are work, which describes the experience and value of work performed by humans and technology, answering questions such as what is the work and what work can be completed through the implementation of cognitive and automation. Workforce is the second one, this being the composition of jobs, skills, and workers to deliver business value, addressing things like who can do the work and how can we enable alternative talent models to, uh, in addition to full-time and traditional unemployment. The third element is workplace, being the physical and virtual configurations and practices to enable business value delivery, looking at where can we get work done can we maximize collaboration, productivity, and consistency across the workforce experience? Over the course of the next 10 minutes, my colleague, Luke Monk, will delve deeper into these three concepts. Over to you, Luke. Thanks, Declan, I appreciate it. And uh, welcome to all, to all of our participants. My name is Luke Monk, and I'm a leader in Deloitte's human capital practice with a focus on digital transformation and the future of work for our manufacturing clients. And I must say that the smart factory and smart operations represents one of the most interesting and exciting areas wherein we are helping our clients truly derive value from attending to those people aspects of change that Declan mentioned a moment ago. In essence, the purpose of the smart factory is to extract data off of the machines um, that run the factory pull that data into the cloud and transform it into predictive algorithms that allow for the more effective and efficient running of the factory, truly linking the digital and the physical within the four walls of the factory. We find that many of our clients um, execute the smart factory against a core set of use cases um, that are known to drive value within uh, manufacturing operations. And there happen to be eight of them, and we call them the grade eight. And really the implementation of the grade eight uh, use cases amongst our manufacturing clients uh, allow us to truly transform all three of the pillars that Declan had mentioned before, work, workplace, and workforce. Luke, can you go into a bit more detail on each of them and, and talk maybe a little bit about where you've seen some of these concepts in action? Certainly, Declan, and uh, thanks for, for the question. I think when talking about the implications um, on work, workforce and workplace in Smart Factory, it's helpful to use an illustrated example. So one of the grade eight use cases is what we call predictive quality. And essentially, uh, this use case uh, drives efficiency and effectiveness within the factory by allowing employees to better predict when a machine is going to start producing scrap or start producing product that doesn't meet the quality standards of the enterprise. Historically, uh, that would drive significant cost for the enterprise um, as we uh, kind of detected the problem after these subpar products were being built. Uh, but now, um, with the algorithms that we have available to us, an employee can truly see when that's going to happen beforehand based on the data that's coming off of uh, the machine sensors and make some key decisions to drive value for the, for the operation. So, for example, 
Um, if I were to see a certain pattern of data that is associated with um, a quality escape, I would be able to take that machine out of service, reroute WIP um, inventory around that machine, and ensure schedule adherence, even in the context of this machine that was going to go down. When we think about what does that mean to the work that was actually done on the factory floor, significant changes kind of are already being made, right? We are we're putting in the hands of employees these analytics that they are going to have to take decisions as a result of, of, of but truly, one of the things that our clients are learning in the context of these transformations is that it's not enough to just define the job as what's left over after this algorithm does what maybe the employee used to do manually. Our clients derive the most value when they look from the top down and start thinking about how the work can be transformed with analytics, with things like process automation or process orchestration, and define the job in terms of the inherently human things that people can do in the factory that machines don't do well. Um, we found that when our clients do this, uh, they are able to not only create additional value for the organization, but also create jobs that are truly engaging to the employees. And it's funny, many times our clients will say, you know, I always had this list of stuff I wanted the employees to do, but they never had time, they never had the tools, um, you know, the backlog of, of non-value added tasks were too great. We found that this transformation is truly an opportunity to get to some of those things and redesign the job from, from bottom up. Interesting. I mean, your, your thought there about an engaged workforce, I mean, I think our research has shown that in an engaged workforce, those organizations tend to be about 20% more profitable than an unengaged organization with a workforce. So that, that's a very interesting um, uh, comment there. That's exactly right, Declan. And I think it's, a, it's actually a good segue into the workforce components that also need to be transformed as a result of um, the smart factory. Um, so if we think about the workforce components, these are truly all of the talent components to an ecosystem that's going to ensure that this job has kind of a fruitful, a fruitful soil in which to land. Um, the first thing that we know to be critical here is to make sure that we have a capability or skill taxonomy that allows the employee to see where they sit within the organization. One of the things that our clients are finding as they move to more digital operations is that oftentimes their aspirations don't kind of coincide with the reality that folks perceive on the job when they, when they get into their jobs. And we have one client in particular I'm thinking about, Declan, who had really low attrition, except for folks who are taking these digital jobs. And their number one reason um, for leaving the organization was, I don't understand where I go next. Yeah. By ensuring that there is going to be a skills taxonomy that creates a network of interrelated jobs, employees begin to perceive that their job is critical to the functioning of the enterprise and there's longevity. They know where they can go next. Exactly, and also broadening their, their basic skills across that dimension. Uh, but also, if you take a look at, you know, if you've got a higher attrition rate, that obviously impacts the bottom line because there's a cost to you know, go hire and replace those employees that have left. And if, how do you train them up uh, to, to the point where they can replace that uh, worker who's decided to leave? Um, there's like, you know, a, a real bottom line cost to doing that. Absolutely. And I think not only the administrative cost of going after um, a new uh, candidate, but probably more importantly, the um, operational cost of an empty seat on the line, not being able to execute against the build plan is truly something that has made the people aspects of this become the number one priority for COOs and operational types um, who had typically not thought about these things. And I think, Declan, uh, a point that you make about the development of this workforce becomes really important. One of the things that we're helping our clients understand is that they need not try to stay in front of 
the technological changes with regard to kind of building repositories of training content within their four walls or within their HR department, but rather kind of open up the aperture and allow access to external content um, and then curate it internally. So I'm talking about things like TED Talks, YouTube videos, open source curriculum in a lot of colleges and universities with regard to technical content, things like Blue Prism, um, and, and, and automation, these things are available to, the, to our clients and to the organization free of charge. It just needs to be brought in. And what we found is as clients are able to get their arms around this paradigm shift of kind of curating versus building content, they're able to keep their employees engaged because they're able to give them access to the most cutting edge learning and development technology. Well, I mean, it's that whole concept of lifelong, lifelong learning and that growth mindset. Um, exactly can you talk a little bit about workplace? So workplace is interesting because I think many of our clients, as we begin these engagements, say, well, I don't think workplace applies. Like, certainly, aren't they going to be working in the factory? And, then, and by and large, that might be true. But it's important to realize that workplace also includes workspace. And that's all of the technology and provisioning of the workplace in order to drive the behaviors that we want to see um, on the part of the employees. Most of our clients are asking for additional collaboration and innovation on the part of, of their factory employees. So things like whether or not the lines can see each other, whether or not work, workers or workspaces are positioned so that they can speak rather than facing a wall or only facing uh, the bench where they might be uh, working have become really critical components to drive that additional level of behavior change and cultural change that our clients have really been looking for. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Luke. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this brief session. Uh, we invite you to join us in the virtual lobby afterwards uh, to learn more. And also, please feel free to reach out to either Luke or myself uh, through LinkedIn. And uh, we wish you all a pleasant day. Take care.